488. I'm just going to point out places in here that they're talking about what we already put up on the board. And there'll be a few new things. We'll actually list some different T cells and list some different B cells as we go through here. And we'll actually talk about the complement system. Who did the complement system? Nobody. Nobody did? Okay, that must have been in Monday's class. But uh, on 488, the first thing, the first big title you see there is non specific community. That's the first thing we started talking about. And if you read down through there, they list a bunch of things that we had listed in non specific community. Can anybody name some of those now? Fever, cough, sneezing, headache, runny nose. Phagocytosis mm -hmm. is actually listed in this, and I think we mentioned that as well. <coughs> Uh, a term on 489 that tends to show up on the test from time to time, time to time, extravasation or diapedesis. Literally means squeezing of white blood cells through the capillary walls out into the tissues. So oozing, if you will, or squeezing, however you want to say that, but that's what's happening there. Now, on the phagocytosis component of this, just briefly, identify some things here. You have phagocytes that flow freely out in the bloodstream, can go anywhere at any time, and you have fixed phagocytes. And a lot of the organs, it's almost like in the state of Oklahoma, you have all these towns. The towns would be organs. Each town has a police force. They have their jurisdiction, but they can any time call in Highway Patrol, OSBI, and those are the ones that fluctuate throughout the state and can help at any place at any time. Our system's really set up the same way. I, I doubt anybody ever put any thought to that. To reason the police bill is set up that way. I doubt they based it off our system, and I know our system didn't base it off the police force. But it is set up the same way. We have fixed phagocytes in organs that has their jurisdiction and pretty much takes care of a lot of things that we don't have to do day in and day out. And then if something big comes in, we got a major criminal with a kidnapping that crossed the state line and we may bring in the FBI for that one. I mean, we, we can bring in stuff from all over in the bloodstream or the, is the major highway to do that. And they may, they mention those there. In fact, they mentioned cup for cells being the fixed phagocyte of the liver. On 490, they have fever. Uh, what The question here would be what causes fever? What causes fever is what's called endogenous pyrogen. Well, we all know the prefix pyro in reference to pyromaniacs that like fire, a pyrogen, this is creating fever. And this is what the hypothalamus allows to create fever, is endogenous pyrogen. Uh, interferons is another uh, the non-specific, I guess, response is the term I'm looking for, because it, it helps fight against viruses. It doesn't, it's not particular what viruses, so it makes it non-specific. And then they start into the specific immunity. And antigens, first term here, an antigen is anything that causes an immune response. Anything that causes an immune response. Now if it causes an allergy or allergic reaction, they actually flip that term a little and call it an allergen. But it's still an immune response, is it not? It is. Now on 491, haptins. Haptins are, are actually non-antigenic by themselves, but when they enter the body, they'll connect to a protein and they'll make your protein look different, and then we think it's something foreign. And this is kind of like an allergic response. Most things that cause allergic responses are harmless to the body, but your immune system thinks they're absolutely devastating. So we create all this immune response watery eyes, sneezing, uh, stopped up, just uh, mucus flowing everywhere, and we feel miserable over what? Something that's not going to cause a problem? Allergies are overactive immune responses. That's what they are. The immunoassays or take-home test, that's nothing more than a, than a pregnancy test you pick up at Walmart, uh, blood typing test, things like that. 492 lymphocytes and lymphoid organs. We know your lymphoid organs are your tonsils, thymus, and spleen. Lymphocytes are made in these areas and matured because of thymosine produced at the thymus. And we have 
a couple different types. Well, this is where they separate T cells and B cells. T cells, we said, uh, made in the lymphoid organs or some made actually in the bone marrow. They mature because of the thymus, and a lot of them actually are made and matured in the thymus. B cells are B cells because of where we found them, bursa, the fabricus of a chicken. And uh, there's a variety of those that tend to specialize more in uh, bacterial infections, uh, antibody production. So that separates our humoral and cell-mediated immunity, which we had up on the board in our second category. And the humoral deals with the antibody production in the B cells, and T cells deal with the viruses and phagocytosis, more so. Now the thymus is talked about here and, and how it produces uh, all these different T cells in the next paragraph there. And that's where they kind of mention the fact that AIDS virus attacks T cells, specifically helper T cells. And once they take care of T cells, uh, and T cells are not there to push forward and trigger the immune response, then you end up dying from some minimal illness that typically the average person would never know they even was infected with it, much less sick from it. Fungal infections. A, pneumon a fungal pneumonia is a very common death cause of AIDS victims. So, secondary lymphoid organs include lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, and areas called pyrus patches under the mucosa of the intestine. So we have some secondary areas here. Some of those tend to get infected for what reason? We jerk them out. Do we live without them? Sure. I mean, anybody have, actually have your tonsils in here? Okay. About half. We've gone through these stages over the years. How are we going to deal with tonsils? And back in my day, oh my gosh, you have tonsils. Let's take them out. Everybody got them taken out back in my day. Just It was a rarity if they didn't. Then doctors got to thinking, huh, I bet they're there for a reason. <laughs> I wonder what that reason is. So well, let's leave them in and see what happens. Well, and then they started just setting criteria. You know, if tonsillectomy comes upon somebody, or tonsill tonsillitis comes upon somebody like strep or just a, just a serious bacterial throat infection more than five times in one year, uh, these tonsils may be chronic infect infected, chronically infected. So if we remove them, then we remove that big pile of baggage of pus and corruption that's causing this problem. And so that's kind of a criteria they started going to. So if you didn't have a lot of throat infections, you still have your tonsils and they're still going good. My family is just chronically infected. And we don't, nobody in my family has tonsils. We just ripped them all out. All my they kids, my wife. They told me if I got one more time, they were going to take mine out and I never got it again well, for years. Well, the older we get, a tonsillectomy <laughs> is a serious deal. For kids, oh, it's awful, but mom's there coddling the kid and taking care of him and suffering for a few days and then just about the time you think it's over the scabs that created back there fall off and here we go again and, but eventually it gets over with for adults it's it's just painful it, it, it's something you don't want to do as an adult no it was i was a kid when they had yeah a kid yeah well maybe you won't ever have to do it no. uh, i had a cousin that ended up getting it done when she was about 20 years old and she, she, she still tell you today, she said, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I'm not sure her pain tolerance is as high as it needed to be, but it didn't matter to me. Uh, I, I was eating and drinking before I left the hospital, and I had wisdom teeth cut out and stopped and got a McDonald's big breakfast on the way home. So those, when it comes to food, it's like, oh, I just had surgery? Can I eat this? <laughs> Let me eat whatever I want to. They just turned me loose. So I recovered pretty fast in most cases. Even if I vomit it up, I'll go eat something else. Eventually, I'll get over the vomiting. So I'm hungry, so I eat. That could be wormy's the reason I eat. I'm not sure. So there's your secondary lymphoid organs. Now, local inflammation is definitely, uh, uh, to me, a local inflammation. They got they haven't listed as specific. Inflammation in general would be non-specific. Would you say? If you just have overall swelling, that can't be a good thing, though. So. Typically, inflammation is in an area of injury or tra trauma, and so that would be specific to, to a particular area, and that's why they have it listed where they do. Uh, let's see what we have on the next uh, 
494, some of this uh, inflammation actually, uh, and I think somebody in here had this as part of their presentation, inflammation uh, allows more things to come to an area, uh, so more phagocytes and more immune response comes to that area and specifically starts attacking the problem. And that's what chemotaxis does, and opsonization is another term, which all encourages more phagocytosis in that area to get more done. On 495, mast cells produce histamine. Histamine allows for inflammation in an area, which encourages opsonization, which is phagocytosis, and chemotaxis, which is more chemicals that bring in more outside immune response cells. So all that kind of goes hand in hand. The effects from histamine produce characteristic symptoms of local inflammation, such as redness and more, swelling, pus, and pain. And I believe it was, maybe it was Josh's, talked about inflammation uh, is a, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Josh, is a, a starting of the healing process. Was that part of your exercise physiology? I mean, really to heal something, uh, we, we need to opsonize in an area and, and get more blood flow to an area to, to fix the damage that's been done there. And uh, the, first thing, the first thing we tend to want to do, and, and medical's been doing this for a long time, is slap ice on it. So that constricts the vessels and slows blood flow. Is that encouraging healing? Supposedly it's gonna speed healing. Then they like to do hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. That just creates confusion in my body and, and, and more pain if you really do the hot, cold to the extremes. So I, I, overall in physiology, I'm a little confused about some of the theory. Now, Mr. Bill over in uh, physical therapy could probably explain that more, but I know the cold is gonna reduce swelling and, and reduce uh, blood flow to an area. But then they turn around and put hot packs on things. I mean, just for the first, I think, I don't know if it's 24 or 48 hours, you're only supposed to ice 15 minutes at a time, so you don't have continuous ice on them. So it allows for some swelling and just limits the swelling. So it don't get all extreme. Right. Possibly the case. We flip-flopped in these laws and rules and theories over the years. Used to, it was just heat, heat, heat. I know uh, pitching through high school and through college back in my day it was just uh, keep it keep it warm uh, when you're done keep heat on it well that's just going to encourage more swelling and and my recovery time was I wasn't going to pitch in three days it's going to be four days and, and now you see pitchers get done and they slap a big bag of ice that covers their whole arm and tape that sucker on there and, and they wear it around for an hour so They've come a long ways. Maybe the reason my arm's hanging by about three threads and everybody else is making millions pitching. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, they sure have adjusted and changed a lot of things over the years in, in their theory of, of treating things like that or maintaining. Examples of diseases in which inflammation plays an important pathogenic role include Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, atheral sclerosis, asthma, Rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, uh, erythromastosis, uh, and diabetes type 1. So these are all some form of inflammatory uh, disease. All right, uh, over on 496, uh, get into functions of B lymphocytes. We know that they play a huge role in identifying the infectious agent and in producing plasma cells and the plasma cells get the job done and then some of those stay and hang around and become memory cells. The memory cells, they just circulate the system looking for that particular illness for years and years and years. So exposure of a B lymphocyte to an appropriate antigen activates the B cell and causes it to enter germinal center of secondary lymphoid organ where it undergoes many cell divisions. Some of the progeny become memory cells. These are visually indistinguishable from the original cell and are important in active immunity. 
Others are transformed into plasma cells, and they are protein factories producing 2,000 antibody proteins per second. Once we get the infectious agent identified, and we are making a, a marker for it, an antibody marker. Antibodies, what, what antibodies do is mark cells for destruction. They, they put a big sign on them that says, somebody kill this cell. That's what antibodies do. And we've got all these other phagocytic cells with monocytes, lymphocytes, whatever it is, that goes and kills that cell. And I have this one theory that uh, Sometimes my imagination gets the best of me. I have this one theory that we've got these antibodies cruising throughout the system, and uh, and here we have we're going to well, every, everything has a really a, a name tag. These are self, self, self recognized as normal component of the body. And we're just going to name this one BB. That's a bad bacteria. So he's in the system. He's cruising around. The antibody notices that this is not a very recognizable name tag. We, we really don't know who this is. So it's the antibody's job to go over. I'm sure they drew straws. See which one gets to go talk to him. <laughs> Goes over and says, uh, how you doing, old buddy, old pal? And kind of sneaks in the back door and kind of picks his brain a little bit. What are you up to? What are you doing? Where are you headed? all these questions and of course uh, this dude being part politician lies to him and uh, when they're done this one says well I'll tell you what I'll be around if you need anything uh, I'll be I'll be easy to find you just uh, you just have a good time slaps him on the back says you have a good day when he slaps him on the back he slaps a little sign on his back that says kill me <laughs> and so when he takes off from there and let's say he cruises through the liver the cupper cells and livers like a massive speed trap in a local town. Oh, there's a kill me sign. So they don't even have to chase him down or anything. They just pull out their weapons and commence to kill him. And, Boy, that was fun. I'm glad they marked him for destruction. That was that was legal. See, unfortunately, uh, we get carried away in a lot of autoimmune diseases, and we don't recognize self, and we slap kill me signs on self. And we start killing off normal body cells and autoimmune diseases, which causes these inflammatory responses we're talking about, whether it be diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, is major inflammation. And uh, you know, there's there's not a good situation in any of those. With arthritis, you think, uh, well, I just live with the pain. Well, it's not good to have all this inflammation all the time. So you take the drugs to reduce inflammation. And the drugs have side effects, right? I mean, there's some serious drugs out there for rheumatoid arthritis that have major side effects. So, well, I don't want all those side effects. Well, if you don't take the drug and you maintain all this inflammation, that in itself will deteriorate the whole process faster. So you take the drug or it kills you, or if you let rheumatoid arthritis kill you, flip a coin. I wish we could calculate, well, if you take the drug, you'll live five more years. The chances of living five more years is greater than just allowing rheumatoid arthritis and you suffer through the pain. There's not a good situation in any of them. There's, there's not a cure. We treat symptoms. Uh, we, we try to prolong life. We try to better your life on a daily basis to make your life better. But the bottom line is that you still have it. And we, that's what we're really good at is kind of put a Band-Aid on the symptoms. You know, this Band-Aid here carries uh, uh, all kinds of stuff that's going to give you other diseases and cancer, but <laughs> that's what's awful about it, is it not? Uh, those, those drug commercials are just brutal. Five, they, they take five seconds to tell you what it, how it can fix your skin, your skin problem, and then the rest of the commercial is all these diseases that they can rattle off as fast as they can in the next 25 seconds or cancers or illnesses that this may cause, but it only causes it in a few people, well, that would be me. You know, that's, that's the way I look at it. it. It would be me. Now, if it's a drawing for something good, that's never going to be me. But if it's a drawing for disease, I'll, I'll get it. You know, so that's a negative way to look at things, but it's kind of a protective way to look at things as well. All right, the antibodies. We have a different several classes of antibodies. I do ask some of these on the test. And so we have IgG, IgA, IgE, IgM, and IgD. 
Now, IgG is the main form of antibodies in circulation, production increased after immunization, secreted during secondary response. Well, first response is, is initial, uh, initial exposure. First response could be uh, antibodies from mom's milk, uh, it could be actual exposure to disease, whatever it may be. Second response uh, is the second time you're exposed to it. It's going to be fairly slow, but not as slow as the first response in our reactions because we have seen it before. So the second response is kind of a booster. IgA, main antibody in external secretion, such as saliva and mother's milk. But this is an easy one to answer because where do you go to get milk? The IgA. Got you, Curly. You won't forget that one now. So, where do you get IgA? Mother's milk. Where do you get milk? IgA. So, there you have it. IgE, allergic. E for allergic. <laughs> That's the best way I know to tell you. <laughs> so, we don't spell well. Uh, it, we, it, we get the job done. IgM function as antigen receptors on lymphocyte surface prior to immunization secreted during primary response. IgD function as antigen receptors on lymphocyte surface prior to immunization. Other functions are unknown. When they say that, we're not real sure what IgD does, but uh, I think IgG, IgA, and IgE are all fair game for the, for the test. So hopefully you'll, you'll remember those. This takes us over to the complement system. The complement system is a pretty massive system when it comes to what it does. And uh, this is a, a major integral part of our immune response. And it's very specific in seeking out antigens, infectious agents, and destroying them. And we have several, several complements, and these are proteins found throughout the body. We have, I think they named them as they discovered them. I don't know why they didn't number them as they discovered them, but they, they numbered them weird. It was, I don't know, but they're not in order. They'll have uh, C1, C4, C2, C3, C5 through 9. So something got out of order somewhere in there. I don't, I don't understand that aspect of it, but C is for complement. The first C1 that was discovered is recognizing the foreign invader, recognition, identifying, oh, that, that is foreign. And then number two, activation is C4, C2, and C3 in that order. <clears throat> and they, they're activating the entire immune response on this aspect. Number three is attack, and that's C5 through C9. I always like the attack mode. But we got to be prepared to attack to do that. Now, the attack phase consists of complement fixation, in which complement proteins attach to the cell membrane and destroy the victim cell. Now, my favorite is the membrane attack complex. And literally what happens is these complement proteins attack this foreign invader. They go over there and they, they stab him a bunch of times. They literally just punch holes all in the cell membrane thing. Well, that should kill him. That, that's just the beginning. What those holes allow is influx of fluid into this foreign invader to the point it just, it just explodes. It's like putting so much air in a balloon it can't take any more and it explodes. So now you got all these pieces and parts of the foreign invader everywhere because you punched holes in him and we had an influx of water, blew him up, now there's people, what a mess. But this mess encourages opsonization, phagocytosis, it encourages all the other things we've been talking about, inflammation. It's all going to show up, bam, clean up the mess real fast like nothing ever happened. So that's all part of the complement system. We identify, we prepare, we attack, and we bring in the cleanup crew. How does that sound? It's not, that, it's not as easy as it sounds, let's put it that way. It sounds real easy. But <clears throat> and they list... They list opsonization, they list chemotaxis, they list uh, histamine, which is inflammation, which allows all the other stuff to happen. Functions of T lymphocytes. Let's look at some different T lymphocytes. Well, killer or cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, they can be identified in the laboratory by a surface molecule called CD8. So this is part of the destructive category. They're going to attack. 
uh, their function to destroy uh, body cells that harbor foreign molecules. We said T cells attack viruses. The purpose of this cell is to find a normal body cell that's infected internally. And see, that's how viruses survive. They get inside a normal cell and they're camouflaged, they're hid. We see, oh, that's a normal cell. This cell's job is to figure out if that cell is harboring bad guys or not. And it's a little cranky. This, this cell's a little bit cranky. If, uh, if it suspicions a good cell, <laughs> but I'm not hurting. Sure you're not. I think you are. Boom. Starts killing everything. But that, that's the reason we have 24 and 48 hour viruses because our immune system is stinking good at what it does. If our immune system was poor, the virus would last forever. It'd just start spreading and get all over us before we... But no, it, it attacks a cell. It multi replicates itself a few times. They go attack other cells. We're sick. Or the immune, it just pisses the immune system off, that's all it did. And the immune system goes attacking, and this is one of them. It not only starts phagocytizing the viruses that's out there, but all these viruses go and infect neighboring cells. The neighboring cells have put out interferon. Now, since they've been attacked, and interferon tells neighboring cells, watch out, they're coming. So they hinder themselves from being attacked, which exposes those that's trying to move into neighboring cells. Phagocytosis takes care of that. And just to clean up the mess, these cells come around and kill all the neighboring cells that might even remotely have one in it, and they're all dead, and we just clean up the mess and move on like nothing ever happened. Sounds like a government job to me. Sounds like Benghazi. Another cover-up. Helper T cells are identified in the laboratory by surface molecules of CD4. As her name implies, these cells enhance immune response. They improve the ability of B lymphocytes to differentiate into plasma cells and secrete specific antibodies. If you break down the system that can secrete specific antibodies, you've taken away our immune response. And it's the helper T cells that allow for T cells and B cells to work together in that intricate component of the immune response. And when that's taken away, when we take away the bridge between those two, you shut down the immune response as we know it, which that's what AIDS does. AIDS pulls out the bridge. Those two don't communicate. The trigger to get each other to work with each other, we create chaos, and AIDS survives in chaos. And they mention AIDS on 501. Lymphokines at the bottom of 501 it, there's several of them, interleukin-1, interleukin-4, interleukin-2, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. All these encourage opsonization. They encourage phagocytosis. T cell receptor proteins, antigen presenting cells. There are some that has, and this is, this is basically what we did here. We presented this cell for death. Some cells work off of that, and then the first one with the T uh, the uh, T lymphocyte we talked about at the top of the next page, top of the previous page, the, the cytotoxic. It doesn't need anybody to tell him that that cell needs to be killed. It determines it and takes care of itself. And then there's several of them that, that needs that kill me sign on there to know that that's okay to kill that one. So that's an antigen presenting cell. I'm presenting an antigen to you to shoot. Isn't that nice of me? I identified this dude as foreign. Please kill him. I just mark him. I don't have the heart to finish him off. You, you finish him off. <laughs> Histocompatibility antigens. We have two histocompatibility complexes. We have major histocompatibility complex one and major histocompatibility complex two. Isn't that nice? We're going to have one of these, uh, whether class one and class two. Class two molecules are produced only by antigen presenting cells, such as macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Now, although this is not 100% solely true, I think this is an easy way to keep this separated in your mind. Uh, class one would be the normal body cells of the body that make us function normally every day. Class two would be our defensive cells. 
any cells involved in defense. So we have the civilians and the military. And typically, if we have military come downtown Poto, they're not here to kill us, are they? I would hope not. That would be friendly fire. Now, that happens in autoimmune responses. They get a little confused in who they're supposed to kill, so we get a lot of cells killed in friendly fire. But in, in a normal situation, type one, all these normal cells of the body are labeled as self, good, whatever their label is, we recognize it, that's good. All major histocompatibility class two are anything dealing with the immune system and they'll recognize self as self and they'll recognize themselves as self and they'll only destroy those that are foreign, those invaders that are foreign. Moving on over to 507, active and passive immunity. Uh, they give a little background. They talk about Edward Jenner. We mentioned cowpox the other day, how he tried to kill a little boy, but he survived and went on to tell about how wonderful Jenner was trying to kill him. Nice wording there. Uh, then past year later, uh, isolated anthrax, and, and then he uh, attenuated anthrax. He heated it up in one case and kind of broke it down, destroyed it. In another case, he threw some formaldehyde in there, and that kind of broke it up, destroyed it. But it was still enough that if we injected it into somebody, they'd recognize it as foreign, but it was too weak to cause any problems. So this, these are almost like the killed immunizations that we utilize. So he wanted to make sure he wasn't gonna cause a problem if we put it in your body. So he wounded it. He, it's, it was like, uh, the, throw the spider in there, let's pull off all of his legs where he can't go anywhere, but it's still a spider, right? That's what he did. Our immune system is crazy. 508, primary and secondary response. Primary is initial exposure. Secondary is like a booster. I think that's the easiest way to put that together. Now, the clonal selection theory, this is a theory based off our, well, it's, it's the theory that we base our immunizations off of. So with immunizations, all we're doing is teaching your immune system what to look for and what not to look for. So if we inject these little foreign invaders in your system, but they're not strong enough to cause an illness, we're telling your system, watch out for these. And the more we expose your immune system to it, the more it builds an army to it, and it really starts watching out for them because we don't like these. We're, we, these, these are not normal. So the clonal selection theory is a process of your system learning what it's supposed to watch out for. We're giving it a hint. It's almost like we're cheating. We're teaching the immune system to prepare ahead, and we're cheating to fight these invasions off. 509, active, uh, active immunity, which uh, I think that goes back there. They even mentioned vaccination, and vaccine means cow. And I don't think we want to be called a cow, so not even a sheep. It'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Yeah, I know if, uh, you know if if a woman's pregnant, you don't want to mention cow because she'll assume you're talking about her. A sheep, but if you call her an old goat, she will will get whipped. That, that, that's all bad. So we immunize. We don't vaccinate. We don't even get close to calling a woman a cow because that could be lethal in itself. No immune system can respond against that. Uh, and they talk about the first successful polio vaccine, the Salk vaccine, was composed of viruses that had been inactivated by treatment with formaldehyde. So this is the one that was act uh, active on the formaldehyde. We went from an immunization of a shot to an immunization of an oral vaccine. Now we're back to the immunization of a shot. The first one we didn't like because it caused a few. The second one we really liked because we got good immunity, but we started not liking it because it caused a few more. And now we're back to the shot, which caused fewer <laughs> cases. So, Immunization, immunological tolerance. This is the ability of your, <coughs> your immune cells tolerating civilians, tolerating the normal cells of the body. We don't want to just go out here and attack everything. And that's what uh, immunological tolerance is talking about. Uh, hopefully we don't produce autoantibodies. Passive immunity, here's where they listed several things like T 
tetanus, hepatitis, rabies, snake venom, anti, uh, antitoxins for these are only temporary. <coughs> and, uh, the one you don't want to get at all is rabies, and you sure don't want to get it for a second time because you cannot take the series of shots more than once. So if you get bit by a rabid skunk, we can probably save you in due time. If you get bit five years from then by another rabid skunk, you're gonna die. Stop messing with skunks. I've got my eye on one I'm fixing to kill. <laughs> and he, he pulled a slip on me that night. I was, uh, I was uh, it gets dark so dang early, I can't get anything done at home. I barely, I, if I leave here at four, it's dark at what, 5.30 yeah. nearly? I can't get anything done. Time I get home, change clothes, and it's freaking dark. So I'm out of dark doing stuff. And, and I pull out to the barn the other evening to do something, and, and there's a coyote. Seldom do I see coyotes around the house because most of them have been shot. And he's a stupid coyote. I didn't have a gun. I thought, well, he'll run off. He went out there and sat down just watching me. So I get in my truck, go to the house, get the gun, come back. He's gone, of course. He probably knew what I was doing. But there's a skunk. I didn't really want to shoot a skunk with a 243. Can you imagine the explosion here? <laughs> so I go to get him with a sucker. He like stops sitting on, on the edge of the road. He stops and looks at me like, yeah, you're for him. And I didn't really want to shoot him that far away. So I just gonna walk up there and just really blow him up. He dies into this, uh, this little culvert. And I should have went back with a shotgun and just stuck a shotgun in the culvert and just blew up the whole culvert, but I didn't. We've done that before and took out several. But uh, I'll, I'll get him one evening. Uh, I'll get out there one evening. He's messing around too far from the culvert. We'll take him out. <laughs> but uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. I like to take the kids out. But this time of year, it gets a little cooler at night. But in the fall, a little bit earlier in the fall, especially we get some rain. In this drier weather, they don't come out as early. But like a little after dark, those varmints like skunks and raccoons and possums and armadillos. That's a big one. They'll come out. And you just go out with a spotlight and a 22 and you kill these varmints right and left, they're everywhere. There's not near as many on my place as there used to be. Nick took a lock into that and he's, he and my nephews have nearly wiped out everything on the place. But we sure don't have to smell that skunk near as often as we used to. Had a neighbor turn me in for spotlight on my own land. He didn't know it was me but he saw this spotlight. The spotlight I had was a real wide spot. It did pretty good from this room length but it, it wasn't one that reached way out there like you'd use to, to poach. Um, I wouldn't know anything about that. But, but uh, he saw this light, so he turned me in. Well, I saw the game board drive by, so it was me and my son and my nephew, and uh, they were 12 or 14 years old at the time. So we took the four-wheeler and went in behind my parents' house and got kind of off the road and come back into the parents' house through the pasture. Sitting in the driveway was the game board. He said, what are you boys doing? just killing skunks and armadillos and he could smell us and know was telling the truth because we smell <laughs> like skunk. We'd kill a big one downwind, that's not very smart, but those two you're just lucky to just come out alive. Anyway, he said, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, you can come over to my house and shoot that skunk underneath my house when he comes out if you want to. <laughs> he didn't rob me a ticket or nothing, but, but uh, he wanted to make sure we wasn't killing deer illegal. But he's got a, he had a skunk he wanted to be exterminated, although we didn't go over there. But, uh, the passive immunity we've got covered with all these hepatitis, rabies, snake venom, tetanus. And then they get into tumor immunology, oncology, uh, study of tumors. We do have an immune response against tumor or tumor type cells. And they explain the types of uh, tumors we have, benign and, and benign is the if you were to have a tumor, that's the one you'd want. And what's the other one? Malignant. Malignant. And the malignancy is uh, the one that has the capability of metastasis that's spreading throughout the body, and that's absolutely the worst scenario you could get into. And the cancer, that term literally means it's Latin for crab because it attaches into the system and starts sloughing cells into the flow of the system. And that's why if it's in the lymph system, it can travel. If it's in the blood flow system, it can travel. And every cell of the body has some form, some contact with the blood flow system. So it's 
Immunological surveillance against cancer was introduced in the 1970s to describe the proposed role of the immune system in fighting cancer. According to this concept, tumor cells frequently appear in the body, but normally recognize and destroy by the immune system before they can cause cancer. So we have an immunological surveillance. It's a type of killer cell, killer T cell. And, and there, here's a question we really, we would like to know an answer to, but we really don't want to know the answer because I think it would absolutely scare you to death. Is how many of us in this room to this day, as young as y'all are, and me sitting here at 46, have already had cancer and never knew it and never will know it because your immune system took care of it for you. I don't think we want to know that answer. Just keep doing your job. Go throw it another hamburger and make it happy. <laughs> keep feeding the immune system. Uh, it's, there are really some scary thoughts in that deal. Natural killer cells, uh, these don't need anybody to present an antigen to them. Nat just the name, natural killer. He's a natural born killer. Get out of his way if you don't want to be killed. This is the attitude that this one has, somewhat kamikaze, even more so than the last cell we talked about. But the natural killer cells are lymphocytes that are considered to be part of the innate uh, immune system. Unlike B and T cells that are part of the adaptive immune system, Natural killer cells do not have surface receptor specific for particular antigens. Instead, these cells display an array of receptors that allow them to distinguish normal from malignantly transformed cells and from cells infected with intracellular pathogens such as viruses. This dude's good. What would we call this, this one in our military today? What's it? Operation. Do what? Some sort of special operation. Uh, yeah, it would be special ops of some kind. He, he's very, very, very good at what he does. And if we send him in, somebody, he's going to come dragging somebody out. Uh, and these cells definitely are something we would want to encourage him. If this guy liked hamburger, we'd feed him hamburger. I think he's going to like steak. I'm feeding him steak. I want to keep this guy going. Keep his, uh, keep his health up here. Immunotherapy for cancer. What is our means of fighting cancer? Chemo, keep naming, there's three of them. Radiation, surgery. When you back up and look at those three, that's pathetic. Chemo kills good cells as well as bad, makes people sicker than a dog, you lose your hair. There's something not right about all the side effects of that. And I've known several people get chemo too fast or too slow or too the wrong amount and they're not with us today because of administration that's how lethal the stuff is and then radiation again lose your hair sicker than a dog vomiting I mean it's why not just put you in a, a microwave I mean it, you're just getting hammered with radiation we try to be specific in the areas where we're doing this so we kill bad cells but look at all the good cells around them that, that are sacrificed and then surgery, to me, surgery just opens up a door of uh, cancer going everywhere. If somebody says, I think you have cancer, I want to do exploratory surgery, I would never let them do exploratory surgery. If they knew it was a benign tumor and they needed to go get it, okay. But I'm, I need to see how bad this, this cancer is. I need to go in. When you expose cancer to oxygen, you might as well have just backed off and sprayed cancer cells inside of you. It'll spread like wildfire. And so exploratory surgery is not a good option. Surgery as far as uh, removing the cancerous tumor that's causing a lot of problems, yeah, that's a pretty good option. Let's get as much of it as we can. And then our backup plan is chemo and radiation. That's not a good scenario, but what options do we have? We saved a lot of lives with it. A lot of people died from it too. It's really early detection and Specific kinds of cancer are much easier treated than others. Thyroid cancer is much easier treated. We go in there and cut the thyroid out. We let your uh, thyroid stimulating hormone cells start climbing. Then we throw in a little radioactive iodine. If there's any cells left from that thyroid, the iodine will be attracted to those cells. It's radioactive, it kills them. System's cleaned up, we put you on thyroxin and we're good to go. If it's all that easy, we'd be pretty good at it. You'd think we'd come up with something after all the years of dealing with cancer. 
we're still throwing radiation and chemo on people. They talk about a few things here that is possible. Uh, and I'll quit with this and we'll start with effects of aging and stress because we'll be a little older and never proud of it. Uh, like in one case, this lady was diagnosed, she had like six months to live, and I don't know particularly what kind of cancer she had. So she gets online and starts looking into the newest research out there on her type of cancer. And she finds a place that's doing this research, and she just basically throws herself at their mercy and says, let me be your guinea pig, what do I have to lose? I'm seeing success, you're showing success here in your research, let's, let's do it on a human so you'll know. And what they were literally doing is going in and taking out a lot of these normal cancer-fighting cells, these different T cells that fight cancer, and it's taking those out and it's taking out lymphokines and, and all the uh, chemicals that promote these cells. And they were growing them in the lab in tremendous amounts, just by the billions, and then injecting them back into the system. It's growing them faster in lab than her body could. And then they, they learn to mimic these other uh, chemicals that the body produces that encourages growth of these. And so they're given injections of those, growing them in the lab and injecting the actual cells back in. And they were actually just all of a sudden just like open a door of army after that one cancer cell. And to my knowledge, she's alive today. And it worked for her, but it, it seems to only work for certain kinds of cancer. So it limited a lot of people in, in that type of research. But, we can get specific with all cancers, okay, this cancer we can do this, this cancer we can do this, then we're getting there. But right now it's just, oh, you got cancer? Here's some chemo. That's not a good scenario. We'll start with the age and, and stress, finish the chapter up easy Friday. And when we come back from the break, we'll be in chapter 20, our last chapter.